Somewhere in 1856, the Supreme Court ruled in the Dred Scott decision, the people of African American descent could not be citizens of the United States and therefore the Constitution didn't apply to them. In 1896, the Supreme Court with Plessy versus Ferguson ruled that segregation was legal as long as separate and equal. These were devastating landmark decisions and people gathered in small churches like this, at least for me, saddened by the news. It's difficult for me to get up and preach a sermon and not deal with that. So I want to ask your prayers as um, we grapple with this text and probably for my preaching students, I probably break a lot of the rules that I taught you yesterday. <laughs> but we under special circumstances here. Now. So let me get to it before the time slips upon me. And I wish that you take your Bibles into the book of Jeremiah. And I told the, the piece about 1856 and 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson, Dred Scott, I think those are the right years. We've been here before. And with amazing creativity and amazing generosity, we have made contributions in the face to this nation of being discriminated against, in some ways outright hated. This text is in Jeremiah 6, the 13th through the 15th chapter, for from the least of them to the greatest, all are greedy for gain, from prophet to priest, all practice deceit. They dress the wound of my people with very little care, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace at all. Are they ashamed of the abomination they have committed? No, they have no shame at all. They do not even know how to blush. So they will fall among the fallen when I punish them. They will collapse, says the Lord. I want to preach something entitled, Will I Die Before I Wake? I want you just to stand for a moment, bow with me in the word of prayer. God, we thank you for just this marvelous opportunity. We thank you for this gracious, gracious pastor who has extended this invitation. God, we thank you for the people who are gathered. We thank you, God, that in this place, you're doing great ministry among a great people. We thank you that we serve a great God. Now you get the glory, God. What we're after is a blessing. If you don't speak, there's nothing the preacher can say. If you don't move, there's nothing the preacher can feel. If you don't anoint, there's nothing the preacher can do. You just get all the glory, and we'll be careful to give you every ounce of the praise and the honor. In Christ's name we pray, amen and amen. amen. And you may be seated. Will I die before I wake? Have you ever heard this prayer? I know you have. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. According uh, to James Baldwin, we use the word God and safety synonymously. And in effect, what most of us mean by the word religion is safety. We are religious, therefore we are safe. As a matter of fact, listening to your pastor yesterday, he told me that in the context of the diversity of this area, this church is a safe 
place. This prayer, if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take, is indicative of a request for safety in the face of death and comfort in the afterlife. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take safety. It's a good prayer. It's an important prayer. It's a powerful prayer. We teach it to our children. It was taught to us. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. I want in these few moments to take that and, and, and flip it. Or rather, should I die before I wake, how about will I wake before I die? Will I die before I become woke? Will America die before it wakes up? Will America die before it wakes? Of course, the most recent Supreme Court decision to strike down affirmative action programs and college admissions. Chief Justice John Robert wrote that schools using race as a factor in admissions decision violates the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, effectively striking down affirmative action in college admissions. Then, in the school loan forgiveness case, the Supreme Court ruled that Biden administration had not clear congressional authorization to issue widespread forgiveness of thousands of dollars for many borrowers. And of course, you know, during the pandemic, they gave out all that money and people got, you know, uh, politicians and our business, they got money and they forgive all, but, but students, uh, we, can't, we can't do that. Or let me jump back, back up for just a moment. I won't take long, but uh, you know, uh, I, I read in the paper that 43% that of the Harvard admissions are legacy people, which I mean donors and your mama went, your daddy went, you know, you get in. That means what, 40, 57% are left? I'd be okay if they took out legacy admissions. I, I'd be okay if they didn't forgive the big shots with all the money and then the court for the first time in its history grants a business open to, a public, to the public a constitutional right to refuse to serve members of a protected class. The court holds the First Amendment web sign design company from a state law that y'all know that prohibits the company from denying wedding websites to same-sex couple if the company chooses to sell in a public workspace. Well, now, because Christian, she can exclude if she don't agree. I wonder if America is going to die before it woke up, before it wakes up. Professor David Murra recounts the spirit of our anti-diversity, equity, and inclusion times when a young white poet tells a female poet of color in a workshop, workshop, I'm just not into identity poems. In reality, Murra says he's really saying that he gets no pleasure from any poems about racial or ethnic identity, no matter their quality. What he means is, I don't want to know you, know who you are, know what your reality is, Moreover, contemplating that is unpleasant for me. Namely, it doesn't give me pleasure. I'm comfortable being ignorant and being forced to confront my ignorance. Not only causes me pain, it takes away from the pleasures of what I enjoy in ways I can't articulate, and this enrages me. I mean, haven't we white people done enough for you blacks? I mean, what? I mean, we've been at this four decades now. It seems like time, aren't we finished? I mean, can't we bring an end to all these extraordinary, generous, legal accom accommodations for black folk and for gay people and anybody who's different, minority, Asians having violence perpetrated? We're just tired of all that. This is a statement that gets spoken to African Americans every day. There's no such thing as racial prejudice. Why don't y'all stop whining and get a job? 
We believe that the law is colorblind. Well, let me say this, since this is going to be my last time preaching here, let me just say it all I have to say. <laughs> I might as well go for it, right? <laughs> you know, these folks are banning books, right? So all you got to do is be offended by a book, go into your school board, fill out a form, and they'll take the book off the shelf. Well, the Constitution says that black people are three-fifths of a person. I'm offended by that. Let's take the Constitution out of the school. We have a person who's running for president on a complete anti-woke. Will America die before it wakes? Will you and I wake before we die? Are you woke? Do these folks really know? Uh, DeSantis runs around talking about, you know, they had the woman on TV. She wrote a whole book on woke. They asked her what woke was. I'm not lying on them. Do we really know what woke is? One of our PhD students, Frederick Douglass Haynes III, the pastor of Friendship West Baptist Church, is doing his dissertation on woke preaching. He wrote a paper for me. With his permission, I'm quoting from his paper. Woke is a term. I know, I, I'm going to the text. This is, this is why I say, stay with me. Because sometimes we don't know what woke is. Woke is a term with a history of defining what it meant to be conscious of unjust and racist systems while fighting for justice in the United States. It was first used in the 1930s by the blues singer Leadbelly in response to the injustice experienced by the Scottsboro Boys. The Scottsboro Boys were nine African-American teenagers and young men from ages 13 to 20. They were accused in Alabama of raping two white women in 1931. The case involved the lynch mob. Before they could get a fair trial, it was all white juries, rust trials. It was a mess. It's commonly excited, uh, cited as an example of legal injustice in the United States legal system that did not allow blacks to be on juries. Only voters could be on juries, and blacks couldn't vote. These boys were totally at the mercy of a white supremacist system and white supremacist jurors except for the uproar by the black community and decent and upstanding people of other races. The phrase, stay woke, turned up as a part of a spoken afterword in the 1938 song written by Huddy Ludbetter, Leadbelly, AKA, for the Scottsboro Boys. Leadbelly is referring to black people being alert to the physical danger of being black in America, inclusive of all the systemic forces that make the danger possible. Barry Beckman wrote in a play in 1971, Garvey Lives, and one of the lines in the play, a character testifies, I've been sleeping all my life, and now that Mr. Garvey done woke me up, I'm going to stay woke. <laughs> woke is understanding what your ancestors went through. Woke is being in touch with the struggle that our people have gone through here and understanding we, we've been fighting to matter ever since we hit these shores. Amen. Erica Baidu, in her song, Master Teacher, in the refrain says, I stay woke. Amen. The word gained momentum in the aftermath of the police slaying of Michael Brown Jr. in Ferguson, Missouri, and the killing of Trayvon Martin in Sanford, Florida by neighborhood watch guard George Zimmerman. Social justice activists marched and organized under the galvanizing phrase, stay woke, as they critiqued the system and reimagined public safety and determined to abolish abusive policing systems. Woke means one is self-aware, critical of the narrative and the lives of white supremacy while striving and working for a better world for all of God's children. Will America die before it wakes? Will America ever become woke? Are you woke? 
One of the ways that generations of black people stayed alive was they believed in a God that was woke. A God who was on the side of liberation and justice. And how did they know that God was on the side of liberation and justice? They found it in the Bible. For generations, we have pulled up the Hebrew prophets because they were woke. They were concerned about the least, the last, the left out. They were concerned about justice and righteousness, concerned about the poor, the stranger, the one far off. How can you imagine that people would risk their lives to get here? and then put them in a cage when they get here. I realize that these are complicated issues, and I realize that we can't take everybody. I realize we gotta come up with sensible policies of who to allow in and who not, I realize that. But why do we have to be so cruel? The cruelty is what bothers me. It, it's the fact that you have the audacity not to even allow a woman the right to decide what to do with her own body. Right. It's the fact that, that you will pass a law that a transgender child can't get medical care. Will we die before we wake up? Because we serve a God who is compassionate and merciful, concerned with the stranger and the one who is far off, I want to bring the prophet Jeremiah to the homiletical stage. In 626 BC, God called Jeremiah to prophesy Jerusalem's coming destruction by armies from the north. Israel had forsaken God by worshiping the idols of Baal, even burning their children as offerings to Baal. The nation had deviated so far from God's laws that they had broken the covenant, causing God to withdraw God's blessings. Jeremiah was guided, guided by God to proclaim that the nation of Judah would suffer famine, foreign conquest, plunder, and captivity in a land of strangers based upon their sin and idolatry. While Jeremiah was prophesying the coming destruction, he denounced a number of other prophets who were prophesying peace. He says, from the least of them to the greatest, all are greedy for gain, from prophet to priest, all practice deceit. They dress the wound of my people with very little care, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace at all. Are they ashamed of the abomination they have committed? No. They have no shame at all. They do not even know how to blush. They have no shame. So they will fall with the fallen when I punish them says the Lord. Jeremiah, as a woke prophet, called the nation to repentance. Maybe the nation was so far gone that they would die before they would wake up. Maybe the nation is so far. But Jeremiah was calling for repentance, calling for repentance, saying that the whole nation has been given over to privilege and greed. They hardened their hearts to God and against the word of God, ignored and persecuted the prophets. They were woke, that were woke. They kept the outward form and appearance of truth and piety when in fact they were doing wickedness by grabbing ratings and money. As the guy at Fox, uh, the head of Fox News said, it ain't, about, it ain't about red or blue, it's about green. We're going to tell our audience whatever they want to hear, whether it's a lie or the truth, because it's about the green. We don't care about red or blue. They did not address the wounds of the people that had been deeply wounded and they gave soothing speeches 
and sermons when the people needed sharp reproofs, which might have brought the people to a true sense of the danger of their condition, promising peace and safety when in fact they were on the brink of disaster. And then this gets me, as the old folks say, have you no shame? My grandma used to say, shame, shame. Your grandmama ever say that? Their hearts were so hardened, they were not ashamed at all, neither could they blush. They could not even blush in the face of a coup, a takeover of democracy, an assertion, and they attempted to insert an authoritarian who lost a legitimate election. They can't even blush. And I especially refer to the priests and prophets who support this craziness, who give biblical legitimacy who soothe the people in their sins and will not raise the specter of their deceit and treachery. God says, they shall fall among them that fall, people and prophets. I hope we wake before we die. I hope we wake before we all die. My children are here, my grandchildren are here. I don't preach this stuff because I like to. I preach it. This is what Martin Luther King said. I don't march because I like to march. I march because I must. He said this, I, I'm, I'm tired of fighting for what should have been mine from birth. I don't march, I don't preach because I like to this. I preach it because it's the truth and I must. I hope we get woke. The questions must be asked. What then can save us? What might we do to become woke? What might, what might have saved them and what might save us? What might save America? We got to at least ask that question. Can I suggest a couple things and uh, I'll be out of here. Can we uh, rescue our educational system from a total collapse in the ignorance? Whatever happened to academic freedom? American youth under this anti-woke education agenda, banning books, restricting access to African-American education are being so badly educated that the only choice is white supremacy or collapse. James Baldwin said it this way. Can I parenthetically say this while I'm saying, since it will be my last time here. <laughs> I don't write a sermon for one hearing. I don't understand how it is in the church for most of us, we'll play the music over and over and over and over again. But the sermon is disposable. I hear it, and a small minority of us will take notes or review it, but the majority of us, it's disposable. But music is never disposable. All we got to do is sing a gospel number, tragedy in commonplace. Oh yeah, Every, boom, we own it. So I, I encourage you, get, get the video, something, get it, go through it. You see, education demands a certain daring, a certain independence of mind. Educators have to teach some people to think. And in order to teach some people to think, you have to teach them about everything. There must not be something they cannot think about, or books, they, this is James Baldwin, or they cannot read. If there's one thing they cannot think about, then they cannot think about anything. 
You see, I could never be a part of a religion and you tell me the only thing I can read is what you print. Because if it's the truth, it's going to stand up regardless as to what I read. So when you say that African American education is of no educational value, and you pull the books off the shelf, Toni Morrison goes off the shelf, James Baldwin goes off the shelf, Lorraine Hansberry goes off the shelf. You are miseducating kids and you're not teaching, teaching them to think because if you, to teach somebody to think, they gotta be able to read everything. And if you can't read everything, you can't think. We raise in children in this country that will, and so it, will we wake up before we die? We raise in children that will not be able to think. We got some teachers in this place. Do you support the school at your church? In your church, support the school. Do you come to the school board meetings in the neighborhood? Are you a woke teacher? Are you a woke administrator? Are you a woke parent? Are you woke? Are you woke? Are you woke? Or do we just let them ban books because we ain't at the meeting? We, we, we got to rescue the educational system from ignorance to teach people to think. Let me go back to that line. That is such a well-written line. It says, if there is one thing they can't think about, then they can't think about anything. They can't think about gay people, trans people. Let me get number two, because I'm trying to get out of here for, you know, I'm trying to stay to the time. I, 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 um, see, American history is so painful, I understand why there's an effort to erase it and not deal with it. Have you ever heard of the Trail of Tears? Something like millions of Native people were pushed out of the East into the middle of the country and America took all that land and all these, all the, it's called the Trail of Tears. You should, you should, you should look it up. Um, I understand why we don't want to deal with it. It's painful to deal with. Throughout human history, people have been criminal toward each other. There have been extermination. We watch Putin bomb hospitals. So the poet said, we're standing helpless before the towering mystery of man's inhumanity to man. I, how can you bomb hospitals and babies? They got on the roof of the school, uh, uh, school, they got on the roof hospital and you still bomb it, even now, bombs. Throughout history, I could give a long list. There weren't just one, there were seven major slave trades across the globe. We're not the only ones. Some of the most brutal was ours, but there have been slaves, people have been inhumane and criminal. So when American crimes are pointed out, it's not necessarily to indict or accuse. The point is, can we own up to it? Ah. It's not the crime, it's the innocence of the crime. It's not the crime, it's pretending like the crime wasn't committed. It's the erasure. Oh, we don't have a racial problem. We're a colorblind society. It's everybody's equal, and we know that's a lie.
The cover-up is always worse than the crime. Having destroyed and are destroying hundreds of thousands of lives, we don't know it and we don't want to know it. We only want to view America from idealism and, idealism and innocence because when we look at America outside of this prism, we don't want our children to feel bad. Can I drop this gem now? You ought to wake up and write this down. <laughs> so the only response that you can possibly have to the truth of history is to feel bad. Why aren't you more response-able? Stay with me. Responsibility is to be response-able. In the world of the psychological sciences, we often get in trouble because we only have one response. We're not response able. So as we grow, someone leaves us or we experience a tragedy or some trauma, we only have one response to that trauma. We go into therapy and we learn to have different responses because we learn to, have re to be response able, responsible. So you mean to tell me that when you look at history and see the crimes perpetrated, your only response is to feel bad. Let me help you how to be responsible. I don't want you to feel bad. I want you just to work with the police department so they stop killing black kids. That's what I want. I really don't want anybody to feel bad. I'm not asking anybody to feel shame. Maybe we, can, maybe we can design together some different responses other than we only got one response to feel bad. That's the only, here you are, the, 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 the governor of a state, Harvard trained, and all you can figure out is one response to history. Come on. You're not response able. Oh, you degreed. Ivy League schools. Finally, third thing, and I'm so close to coming down from here, because, you know, sometimes when I, when I preach like this, and I, I, I did a sermon, and I was talking about African-American people being shot, walking away from the police, and I said, I want you all to know I'm not anti-police because it's probably going to take the police to get me out of here, some of this stuff I'm saying. <laughs> this is tough stuff. It's tough stuff. We must also get the social reading of history correct. History means nothing if you don't learn from it. We still romanticizing history, talking about the wild, wild west, cowboys and Indians. And whenever one group is always good and the other group is always bad, this is history as domination and power. This is not the kind of history that most people are interested in. I'm not interested in, in being betrayed. Sometimes when we look at things very closely, we don't know who the good guys and who the bad guys are. A truthful understanding of the word history is that history is common. It belongs to us all. Right. History is expressed in multivocal understandings like a family. Y'all got families, and you all know that everybody has a different snapshot. So when, yeah. da when daddy dies, one kid has one response to, the, to daddy going by, and another kid has another response. And so we don't have the full picture until we get together and everybody discuss their picture because everybody has a shot, picture shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the same way in America. There is not one history of America because the, the family snapshot might look different from this perspective, look different from this perspective, and so it's called multivocal understandings of history.
1619 project is a multi-vocal understanding of history. Yeah. 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 So you want to take that off the shelf, you want to ban it, you, know, you want people to read it, no, you can't have it, no, 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 no. Well, it's everybody. It's gay people's history, it's LGBTQIA history, it's, it's, it's Asian Americans, it's, it's, every, it's, every, it's Jewish Americans, it's, it's everybody's history. It's rural A Appalachia Americans have a right to have a voice in history, but you want to have one group, one perspective to have, it's, 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 uh, it's manifest destiny. It's, uh, will America wake up before it dies? Will America ever get woke? I'm not sure. Some days like today, when, uh, uh, some days like when, you know, after George Floyd, I thought, well, maybe, just maybe. You know what? Well, maybe, maybe we finally get it. Maybe we're finally moving in the right direction. Maybe we got it. And then now I look the retrenchment, the, the, the backlash, the pullback. In truth, the jury's out. And so I, um, I'm reading John Roberts' statements. I'm reading, and um, the more I read, the more despairing I become. But there's hope. I know that, uh, you know, we, I'm not, where's the hope? It's here. I want you to pray with me about that hope is not just an individual concept between you and God. That's part of it. It's just me and Jesus. But I wonder if hope is communal. I wonder if the question is, who do you hope with? I wonder when I look at you, and everything that I'm trying to put out, Virginia, you're writing at least some of it. Maybe you're writing the letter you're getting ready to send me, send me tell I'm crazy, but you, you know. <laughs> But I look at you and I hope with you because I get the sense that you hope with me. I look, you took time to come to a preaching class. You're sitting here. Some of y'all are still here. After all this sermon, this wasn't a sermon y'all expected. You, you still sitting here. And so you're hoping with me and I'm hoping with you. And to, there's a, so maybe when it was ruled by the Supreme Court that people of African descent could not be citizens of the United States and therefore the Constitution didn't apply to us. They met in a church somewhere and said, yet there's a God somewhere, a God of mercy and compassion and justice and love, a God who looks down upon our lowest state, a God who has given us each other. I hope with you and you hope with me and I hope with you and you hope with me and we hope and we serve and we sing and we pray and then we march and then we vote and then we get on school boards and then we participate and then we go to law school and then we become philanthropists and then and then and then and then and then. I mean, I, I, I'm appreciative that y'all have stayed this long. It's a sign of hope. 
that you want what I want, which is for everybody to have a space and a place. For everybody to have value and to have dignity, self-respect, to have food for their stomachs, clothes for their backs, education for their brains. I believe in a multiracial, multiethnic, multireligious America. I believe trans people have a place, and I believe Jewish people, and I believe and Asians, I believe, I believe, I believe. And if I had to go home and hope by myself, I couldn't pull it off. But on these kind of days, to come to the house of prayer, praise, and worship and see the saints and feel the worship and to see your smiling faces, to experience that you're still here, believe and trust in God is going to do this. I think that I'm heading to my seat now. Um, <laughs> I'm checking with God to see, did I need, do I need to say anything else? Do I just need to sit down? In Jesus' name. Amen.